Hello and welcome back to my hyperfixations. Today I'm really excited because I'm going to show you a current hyperfixation that I used to love in the past and now I've revolving door it around and I'm back very much so obsessed with it and that is crochet. So I first got into crochet probably like five years ago, hated it, thought it was the worst thing ever. And then two years ago, I got COVID and I didn't have the energy to do anything, but I didn't want to just lay around. So I picked crochet back up and I fell in love with it. So I am going to show you how to make the easiest and the most basic of starter things and that is a granny square because you can take a granny square and essentially turn it into anything that you want afterwards. So all you're going to need is some yarn and when you buy your yarn, you can see on the back, it'll tell you what weight it is. That basically just means the thickness of yarn. <laughs> My cat's coming to say hello as well. Um, so it'll tell you what the thickness of yarn is. And then it'll also tell you the size of hook that you need. So the yarn that we've got here is a worsted weight, which is a four. That's the most common yarn that you're going to find. So um, it's, it's very accessible. And also if you're going to buy the hook for a size four yarn, you're gonna be able to use it with a ton of things afterwards. So the hook size for this yarn is going to be a five millimeter or a US size eight. Um, these are all available at any craft store. Um, I'm in Canada, so you could go to Michael's, you can order online, you can get them basically from any craft place, you'll be able to get crochet. One of my favorite things about crochet is actually that it's really accessible and really easy to pick up. So yeah, let's get started with making our granny square. So I am going to use um, like a darker yarn just to show up a little bit better on camera. Um, it's the exact same size as the white yarn. It's a worsted weight size four. If you want, like I said, you can use any kind of yarn that you want for this. If you want it to work up a little bit quicker, you can use a thicker yarn. Um, if you want it to be a little more dainty, you can use a fine yarn. Just follow whatever is on the package. So to start your square, you're going to start by doing something that's called a magic ring and it's a little bit hard to get the hang of at first but i promise this is going to be the hardest part is just getting it started it's like a metaphor for life you know the hardest is just beginning <laughs> so what you're going to do is you'll take the yarn in your hand you'll have the little loose end and then what you call the working yarn which is the big old ball and you'll have it on your hand i like to wrap around two fingers and make an x So you'll see here, I've got a little X. I take my hook, I reach through the X. I'm going to grab that yarn, pull it over and make a loop. So you can see I've got kind of my little circle and then I've got a loop over that. Sorry, it might be a little hard to see. So once you're at this stage, you're going to chain up Three. So to make a chain, this is where we originally were at. We had a circle on our hook. We'll take our working yarn. So what's attached to the ball, you're going to yarn over. So put the yarn over the hook and you're going to pull through that little circle that you already have on the hook like so. So that is a chain. So we've just chained one and you're going to go ahead and chain two more just like that. So one, two and three total. So you should have something that looks like this. After you've done that, you're going to yarn over your hook, insert the hook inside of the circle that you've made and pull through. So right now you should have three little loopies on your hook. So one, two, three, you're going to yarn over again, pull through the first, two loops on the hook. So you should have two um, loops still on there. Yarn over again and pull through those next two loops as well. So you only have one remaining. So this is called a double crochet in US terms. 
I'm not entirely sure what it is called in UK terms, but there are UK terms, there are US terms. As a Canadian, um, we all understand what it's like to be caught between the US-UK dichotomy of pronouncing things different. Um, but for the most part, the patterns that I've seen use US, so you can get familiar with US terminology when you're starting off. And I find that you can find more than enough patterns to help you. Um, but yeah, so this is called a double crochet and we're going to do another one. So again, take your yarn, yarn over, put it through the circle, pull a loop up. So you've got three loops on your hook, yarn over again and pull through two loops, yarn over again, pull through two loops. So now we've got a little cluster of three. And what we're going to do here is we're going to chain one. So like we did before, just put a yarn over and pull through the loop you've chained one. So right now we have a little cluster. We are going to make four total of this cluster. And those are going to be the sides of our granny square. Um, so we'll do again, yarn over, do a double crochet. So one, two, and three, and then we'll chain one, and then do another cluster of three. The hardest part of this is needing to remember to count. It's always very tricky. And then we chain one, and then our last cluster of three here. So one, two, and three. And now we're gonna go back to our beginning. So if you pull this little loose tail end here, it's gonna close up the circle that you have. So you can kind of close that circle here. We're gonna go find the top of that first chain three that we made. So for me, it's right here. And we are going to chain one go into that top of our original chain three with our hook, yarn over, pull up a loop, and then right through that other loop. So that's called a slip stitch, what we just did there. And now we have the beginning of our granny square. We have our cute little square and we just build up from here. So to do that, we are going to chain three again. So one, two, and three. And then we're going to actually insert the hook into where we just came from. So instead of going forward one, you're kind of going to go backwards one. And like before, we're still working in double crochets. So you're going to yarn over, put it through that gap, pull up a yarn, yarn over, pull through two, pull through two. Do that again, yarn over into the exact same gap as the other two and pull through two, pull through two. So you should have three in this little spot here. Next thing we are going to do is look for our chain, which is here. Pull up two, pull up two. We're just crocheting our way through here trying to get our square started. So what we're going to do is chain one and go in the exact same and then do another set of three. So this is going to be a corner that we're building. Two, three. So anytime you get to a corner, you're going to go ahead and do basically six, <laughs> six 
double crochets with a chain in the middle. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look for the gap after our three that we had done on the first row. And then there's that chain one spot. So we're going to yarn over, go through that chain one spot and do one, two, three double crochets, chain one, and then do again, one, two, and three, double crochet into the exact same loop. And we're just going to do this all the way around so we get to the next gap here. The hardest part of this is just keeping track in threes. I do tend to try and pick projects for myself that don't require a lot of counting um, and a lot of keeping track of things just because with an attention deficit disorder, uh, you have an attention deficit. And so it can be hard to keep track of a lot of rows and a lot of color changes and really fancy, fancy, schmancy things. So. I prefer just to keep it simple because I find that I'll actually do my project if it's that way. Um, so like I said, this one's mostly just counting in threes. So one, two, three, one, two, three, into the same hole as before. And then we're back to our beginning. So we're gonna do again, one, two, three. And this is where we had started with those three. So that's already half of our corner done. So we'll do the other half of the corner. And then as before, we are going to chain one, go into the top of those stitches we'd already done, pull up a loop and slip stitch together. So you can see here we've kind of got our square coming together. Um, if it looks a little lopsided, uh, it's because it is. <laughs> Not everything has to be perfect. Did I miscount? No. I think I might have miscounted in my first row. Look, there's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two. I think I'm missing a stitch in my first row. What did I say about attention deficits and uh, not being able to keep up with complex patterns? So I've already done it where I've made a boop boop. So we are going to have to do what's called frogging, which is take this apart and go back and restart it. So um, I'm going to go back and restart it. All of the instructions I've given you so far are correct. I promise. I'm just going to go ahead and make mine again. <laughs> I can't believe I miscounted. Happens to all of us though, uh, <laughs> especially when you're first starting out a hobby, right? Like you're gonna make mistakes. It's okay, it happens. I've been doing this for a while now and I'm still making mistakes. Oh, and I forgot to say, when you're going in between corners, you don't need to chain one. You can just go directly into the next corner. The only time you're going to chain one is when you are making the corner. So in between the three little sections of your corner is where you'll do the chain one. But everywhere else, you'll just hop straight into it. And that chain one is going to help us keep track of where we're putting our corners. If you do find that you're losing track of where your corners are, that is totally fine. You can use a stitch marker. So if you want, you can go out and buy a stitch marker. They just kind of look like little earrings. And if you don't want to buy a stitch marker, you can in fact just use like a hoop earring or something that you can slip into the stitch to show you where it is. Um, I've used twist ties in the past. Some people use paper clips or bobby pins. Literally anything that you can just slide in between the stitch to show where it is um, and that you can get out pretty easily afterwards, you can use. Like I said, crochet is really, really accessible and affordable to start doing. So don't feel like you need to spend a lot of money on it if you are going to get into it. I find that 
as a person who has hyperfixations, when I'm getting into a hobby at first, I can end up spending so much money because I want to buy the best of everything possible. I want to have all of the tools I need. I somehow always convince myself that this is going to be like my new career path, that this is going to be my forever thing that I'm doing. Um, and then I end up not really touching the hobby afterwards and having sunk just an enormous amount of money into it. So I, I caution you to learn from my mistakes and if possible, just buy what is cheap or only the bare essentials until you can kind of show that you're going to use it more. Um, but if you do decide to invest, there's nothing wrong with that either. If you've got the expendable income and you wanna treat yourself to some hobby goods, get it. <laughs> Absolutely get it. Okay, so we are back. We have a square. It's beautiful. We love it. She's all we've ever wanted. And basically, we're just going to repeat this. Oh, my cat just scratched my leg really bad. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got our square completed here. As you can see, we've got our nice four corners. And we're basically just going to do the exact same thing until we have a square that is the size that we want. So I'm going to do another two rows. I find that that's kind of like an average granny square size. Um, and I'll just show you what to do here since we have little connection points. So I'm at my corner and we're going to do the same thing where we chain three, one, two, three. Yarn over into that spot and you're going to do two double crochets. Uh, okay, so once you have those complete, you're going to see that there is that chain one spot or that, that bridge spot in between your corners. So into there, you are just going to do the three double crochets. And any spot like that, that is not a corner, you're just going to do the three double crochets. Once you get back to your corner, you'll do three double crochet followed by your chain one, and then another three double crochet, bringing us back to our next spot that is a side and not a corner. So we'll just do three into there. And we're just going to repeat this pattern all the way around until the square gets to as big as it wants. Well, as big as you want it to get, not as big as a square wants to get. <laughs> and like I said, you can kind of do this to whatever size you want. So if you make a smaller granny square, you can use it for like coasters are really popular or dishcloths. If you just keep going for a really long time, you can make it into a blanket, a large square blanket. Um, some folks will turn these into tote bags. If you've got quite a few squares, you can join them together. And I'll show some patterns kind of at the end of ideas for what you can do with your granny squares once you have them. Honestly, it's kind of like the foundation, the building block to so many different things. So you can make a lot of stuff if you just know how to make a square, which is really fun. And I mean, there's more advanced techniques you can learn too, but I like the simple ones. I'm a simple girl of simple memes. And like I said, I prefer to keep my patterns kind of simple and keep the projects that I work on kind of simple. First reason, because it can be really hard to keep track of stuff like that. There are tools that can help you. There are stitch counters and row counters. They're pretty cool. You put them on your finger or you can even put them on your hook um, and you just tap like a little button and it'll keep track of your rows or your stitches for you if you have a hard time doing it in your head and keeping track of it yourself. Um, and then the other reason why I prefer these smaller, simpler projects is because I like the instant payoff of having completed something. So a lot of the times when you're working in fiber crafts, it can take quite a long time to make something bigger. 
Um, and I find that I get bored if I don't get that sweet, sweet instant hit of dopamine that tells me that, hey, we've made it. <laughs> we did this project. It's done. It's complete. And that can be tough too because I have a whole bunch of works in progress that I've left abandoned. And maybe one day I'll go finish them. Maybe. But I like to do these smaller ones because I know that there's a higher likelihood that I will complete a project. And I never want to make myself feel guilty if I don't end up completing a project. Like, it happens. It really does. Like, so sometimes you just can't get the drive to finish the project all the way through. And that's okay. It's a hobby. Things are allowed to stay as hobbies. You don't have to turn them into your be-all, end-all. Even if it is a hyperfixation, you're okay to have things that come and go out of your life. You can, you can do that. So this is where I'm at now. I have done another row on my square and I'm gonna do one more before I finish it off. So for a lot of people with ADHD, you do something that's called stimming. Um, and it's also something that's really commonly found in people with autism as well. Like that we are all under kind of the same neurodivergent umbrella. So a stim, it's kind of what you would classify more so as the hyperactivity part of the disorder. So it's, you know, when people are tapping their foot a lot or they're rocking back and forth or uh, some people like to click the pen, the top of the pen a lot. Um, those are stims. They're something that you're doing. It's a way for your body to just kind of like cope with what's going on to release a little bit of energy. And for a long time, I actually didn't think that I stimmed because I didn't do kind of what is classically ADHD. I didn't have a hard time sitting in my desk. I didn't, you know, feel the need to get up and run around. I didn't present in a way that I thought ADHD presented as. I was a little bit different. And then I realized that I do stim in a lot of different ways. <laughs> One of which is by doing stuff like this, like crochet. Before I got into crochet, I knit. I was a knitter. For a long time I was always doing something with my hands and so that was one of the ways that I was stimming and this is kind of similar to that where it gives me an outlet to move my body and again I never really thought of it as a stim because it seems more focused but it is because it's a way to be moving and a way that keeps me from doing some of my other stims so that's why I really like doing kind of these hands-on crafts is it gives me an outlet. And also if I'm watching TV or anything like that, I can find it really hard just to sit down and watch a program. It's, it can just be really difficult to, to give it your full attention and to just sit there and not do anything. So for me, I mostly do crochet and stuff when I'm watching TV or if I'm watching a movie, um, I find that I'm actually able to focus a little bit better on what's going on if I have something to do with my hands. So if you also have a really hard time watching something and not doing anything, I uh, highly recommend picking up some crochet. It's great. Um, and stick to the simple stuff. If you're doing something that's kind of like brainless with your hands, it's giving you an outlet to move but it's also letting you pay attention to the program that you're watching. So it's a win-win and you can leave whatever it is that you're watching with, you know, progress made on a project. Who doesn't love that? <laughs> Go in. We're almost halfway done our last round here. And for anyone who's wondering a little bit more about stims, um, like I said, I have a few that I do that I didn't realize were stimming until I looked a little bit further into the, the subject. And one of the things that I do actually is I trace my teeth inside of my mouth with my tongue. Um, I do that a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and it's, it is a stim and it's not one that people can see. It's one that is going on solely within my own body. Um, and like, in fact, I used to do it so much that I would get a raw tongue. <laughs> because I would be rubbing it over my teeth. And I think it's one of the ways where females in particular can differ from males who have ADHD because 
males tend to have a really outward expression of that hyperactivity. You know, they're bouncing off the walls or they're doing sports or they're, you know, jiggling their legs a lot or things like that. Whereas women have tended to do those hyperactive things in a way that is a little bit more subtle just because of the way that our society is um, and the way that women kind of have to hide a little bit more of their eccentricities in public, if you will. So um, there are a bunch of ways, I think, that females will stim differently from males, which is also really cool. Um, but it's just as valid if you are stimming in a way that maybe you haven't seen before or that maybe doesn't present the classically defined way that a stim would present. We are all kind of going through our neurodiversity in a way that is a little bit unique and that's totally cool. All right, so we are on the last section of our square. I'm gonna do the chain one, go into my top here. And we've got a little square. So the way that I'm gonna finish this off is I've got my little loop here. I'm gonna pull up one, so just a chain one. So we're going to do our slip stitch, pull through, and then we're going to actually cut this thread and just pull it all the way through and it's going to make a knot. And then we are going to pull that thread, so you kind of yarn over and pull it through the loop and pull it tight and it'll make a nice little knot in the corner. And there you have a granny square. So once you're done your granny square, you'll have these loose ends <laughs> kind of hanging around. And for me, honestly, this is the worst part of any kind of knit project is dealing with your ends. I find it so tedious and monotonous but essentially what you do is you take a little needle. Um, I, this one I think is, I wanna say a darning needle, um, but you would just want one that has a, a little bit of a bigger hole on the end so that you can fit your yarn through. So you'll take your end and then you're just going to weave these ends in. So I just kind of stick them into any of the threads along the back. I'll go a little bit of the way down and you kind of want to weave it into where you're not going to notice it so much. So you can see that there are holes um, around the edges here. So I'm going to avoid weaving it over one of those holes so that you don't see the thread. And then I'm just going to trim that excess off. Then we'll repeat for the center here. And you can see that mine isn't perfectly square. That's okay. Um, I don't mind the imperfection. I honestly will usually just leave it. It shows that it's handmade. But if you are a real crochet artist, I say real, but honestly, anyone who makes anything with crochet is a real crochet person, even if you aren't an expert at it. Um, but people who do care about having their projects a little bit more uniformly put together we'll do what's called blocking, which is when you wet down your final product and then you kind of stretch it and that will help the yarn settle into the shape that it is supposed to be. So I've actually never blocked anything in my life. I find it just like a bit of a tedious extra step and I'm all about removing barriers to me doing things and that one's a barrier. But if you wanted to try blocking, you can either buy tools to do it um, or you can make your own blocking station out of a piece of cardboard and then you would just stick like, I don't know, if you had chopsticks, you could use chopsticks. If you have, I mean, a bunch of needles, you could use that. But basically anything where you would take it and you would stretch your four corners out like so after you had wet the square and it would just help everything settle in once it dries down. Again, I'm not gonna do that. I don't mind my square looking how it looks. So there we have it. It's our finished square. The ends are all weaved in. So if you were making a garment out of this, you would aim to have this back panel where the ends are weaved in, um, kind of facing towards your body. That way you don't see any of them. And 
As mentioned earlier, this is just the basic square that I chose to stop at this size. If you wanted, you could make it bigger and you could have more of a dishcloth. This is kind of coaster size, I would say. If you keep going, you could have a full size blanket. Just to give you a little bit more of an idea of what you can do, my current project right now is essentially the same thing. It's a granny square with the same pattern, only it's six sides instead of four. So just adding two extra sides on as you're making it. And what this does is it looks kind of like this floppy star thing, but you can make cardigans out of it. So right now this looks like a cardigan for like a little teddy bear or something. But if you keep on adding rows on, you can get a half of a cardigan that is more human sized and then finish it up. And this is, like I said, the exact same concept as our square. It's just adding an extra side on it. So once you know the basics of crochet, you can kind of go anywhere that you want to. If you do want to just stick to making the squares, um, if you lay them out and attach them together, you can make bags, you can make sweaters, you can make vests. Like the options are so very, very endless and only limited to what you can imagine, which is super swaggy and neat and great. So <laughs> this, is, this is my current hyperfixation, honestly. I'm I'm back in the crochet club very deeply. It has been all consuming. And maybe that's my one word of caution here. If you do have a little bit more of an obsessive personality and you are getting into something like crochet, um, please take care of your wrists. Uh, working on bigger projects for really long times can cause a lot of strain on your wrists and, and on your knuckles, depending on how you hold your yarn and how you hold your hook. So make sure that you take breaks, make sure that you aren't working too, too long, especially if you are just starting out because you don't want to cause any injury in your wrist. I know it's kind of silly and it's a little bit mima of me, but I'm a cautionary tale. I was really into my crochet. I was doing it for far too many hours and now, about a week after I have taken kind of a pause from crocheting to give my wrist a break, it still actually kind of hurts. So, don't injure yourself in the pursuit of crochet. Just my, my hot tip for my fellow ADHD or obsessive personality type people, take care of your body. <laughs> You've only got one. So, that's my cautionary tale. But. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me and for making a little granny square. I hope you enjoyed learning some crochet and potentially have something great to stim with or to do while you're watching TV. So thank you so much for watching and tune in for our next episode. Bye.